you've got a Bible with you, please turn to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. I always think it's advisable that you guys bring Bibles, at least electronically or, in, or, or, or physically, um, just because as we're going through Scripture, it's, it's very beneficial for you to be able to follow along. Hopefully, I think it's going to be on the screen as well, but it's still beneficial for you to be able to follow along and weigh and test what I'm saying, just so you know I'm not making it up. <laughs> okay, so today we have a, a strange sermon. While we are still in the book of John, um, at the same time, it's going to be a little bit more of a topical sermon today. And what I mean by topical is, is we're going to be taking a very short amount of the book of John and actually be going through a little bit more of a topical subject at the end of the sermon based off a testimony. And I'm going to warn you in advance so that no one can say I didn't warn you. Um, well, you know when you're a new parent, all you can do is talk about being a new parent and talk about your baby? Um, I'm just going to warn you a little bit that in this sermon there is a little bit of a testimony based off becoming a new parent. And, and I just want to let you know, don't worry, every Sunday isn't going to be just me telling you in the sermons about my baby. But the point is, is that today there is a little bit of a testimony about that, which ties in very well with today's sermon. But the reason I, I'm saying this is because I'm quite excited about today's sermon. And, and I truly am hoping, and not, I'm not hoping by creating this, by saying this, I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's going to do this. But I truly believe that, that you will leave excited today after this sermon as well. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to do in the hearts and minds. He's already done it in mine and made me quite excited as to this message. And I'm hoping he's going to do the same for you as well. So we're going to be in the last little bit of John 13, which Ben Kente left for me. Um, and then we're going to be going into John 14 as well. And even, and later on you'll understand this, but even the fact that this little bit was left for me, not on purpose, but simply because Ben didn't cover it, is incredible when you get to the end of this sermon you'll realize why it's incredible because God's providence is all the way through the the message today and and as as his providence always should be before we start let's pray Lord I thank you for the good news that I'm able to share today I thank you Lord that it's not bad news that it's not news that causes sadness but it's news that should cause excitement and happiness Lord, I just pray that that excitement would be shared with my brothers and sisters. I pray that it would be tangible in their hearts, not because I've said it, but because your Holy Spirit plants it, Lord. Father, I pray this message would go out today and change us. I pray, Lord, we would not leave the same as we came in, Father. I pray that we would not grow stagnant in our faith, but that this sermon would be a fresh, uh, fresh wind, Lord, a fresh wind over our lives and over our devotion and our zeal. I thank you so much, Lord, for what you're doing at DC. And I just pray, Lord, this message would be another piece of the temple, another piece of the brick added to the foundation, Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for today. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, Ben took us through most of um, John 13. And, and one of the main points I took from his sermon that I really, really liked was Ben talked about Jesus looking past the cross. If you were here last week or if you've listened to it on, online, much of Ben's sermon was based around Jesus looking past it. He knew what he had to do at the cross, but he looked past it. When he said, my hour has come to be glorified. My hour has come to go to the Father. So although he knew what he had to do at the cross, he was looking at what the cross was going to accomplish. He was looking past the suffering, past the death, past the resurrection, and he was looking at what was going to be accomplished through it. The whole purpose of the mission, the whole purpose of him coming to earth is what Jesus had his mind set on. And it's, it's quite incredible when you look at it from that perspective. And I think from Ben last week, we learned a great lesson in how we are meant to look at the different difficult circumstances in life, having that eternal perspective, looking past suffering and looking at where our eternal dwelling is going to be. So following on from that, we're going to be starting in verse 36. Jesus has just finished in verse 34, 35, basically saying to the disciples, where I am going, you cannot come. I'm going somewhere and you're not able to go with me right now. It's not going to happen. 
Now, for us to understand the implications of this for the disciples, I need you to remember that these men gave up everything to follow Jesus. They gave up businesses, they gave up jobs, they gave up their homes, and they followed this rabbi, who they only deemed as a rabbi at the time, for three years of their life. They devoted three years to this man, following him for three years. He was their everything. When the 72 disciples left, when the thousands of people left, it was only the 12 that were left. And when Jesus said, will you leave me as well? Peter said, where can I go? You have the words of eternal life. So these men gave Jesus all they had. And Jesus is now saying to them in an intimate meal, only hours or days before his death, he's saying to them, I'm going and you cannot come with me. You have followed me for three years. Been on my heel for three years. I've led you everywhere for three years. But now I'm going and you're not coming with me. So let's have a look at Peter's reaction to this. Verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Peter's question is a, is a warranted one. Lord, where are you going? But what it does also tell us, and something I've been reminding us and Ben's been reminding us over the course of going through the book of John, is that the disciples did not fully understand they understood something, but they did not understand everything. In chapter 16, when we get there, they ask the same question. Lord, where are you going? When are you going? Where, how can we get there? See, Jesus was investing into their lives for understanding they would have after he had died and resurrected. But at this present time, the disciples still do not get it. They still do not fully understand what Jesus is talking about. And to them, he is indeed the Messiah, but they have not yet comprehended that he, they, he has come to set them free from a sinful bondage. He has come to die for their sins. For the disciples, the Messiah, for them, is still very much like the Jewish understanding of the Messiah, the mighty King David, who comes to rid them of their physical enemies and give them their land back. And in a way, the disciples were still looking at Jesus with a little bit of that expectation, not truly understanding what he had actually come to do. Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. The key word there is now. If Jesus had said, where I am going, you cannot follow, we'd be pretty depressed right now. This would be a pretty terrible story with no good news. Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. And we're going to get into, I'm not going to go too much into that right now. We're going to get much more into that in a little bit. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Peter says, Lord, I'll do anything for you. I'll die for you. I'll follow you anywhere, Lord. It doesn't matter where you're going. I'm your man. If you were to line up the 12 disciples and Jesus was to stand in front of them and say, I have the most perilous, dangerous, horrible mission in the world. It's going to cause great personal affliction and pain. Who volunteers? Peter would be the guy who puts his foot forward and goes, I'll do it without ever having thought about what he was saying. I sympathise a great deal with Peter, if I was being honest. I do sympathise a great deal with him. When you go through the different Gospels and when you go through the book of Acts, the Apostle Peter always puts his foot forward before thinking about it, always speaks without thinking about what he's going to say, and always wants to be the person to kind of be like, I'm here, Lord, I'm here, I'm right here. He, he's not really a people pleaser, but when it comes to the Lord, he always wants to be the one who's first. He was the one who said to John, 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 lean over and ask him, who's going to betray him? Is it me? Ask him quickly, lean over, John, lean over. Peter is always the one putting his foot forward without ever really counting the cost before he does so. 
He's the same one who, when Jesus said, I must go and pretty much die, Peter grabs him and says, no, Lord, don't say these things. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So Peter is, is unfortunately plagued with a mixture of things. A little bit of pride mixed with a genuine desire and a genuine love and zeal for the Lord and a little bit of people pleasing as well. All stirred into one makes the disciple Peter. And if you're thinking I'm going a bit too far and that's a stretch, it's not because when we look at the book of Acts, even after he's now the mighty apostle who's been beaten and persecuted, we see him make the same mistake when he sits with the Jewish brothers instead of the Gentiles and changes his demeanor, changes how he's acting because he wants to be seen in a certain light. So Peter evidently had a bit of a crux in his character that Jesus had to work out. And I sympathize with him greatly because I, I see a lot of young Aaron and other young men in Peter. The desire to, to kind of, I'm here, Lord, I'm here. I, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything without ever having really thought about the cost of what it's going to entail. I'd like to think I'm a little bit more mature now, but I'm sure I can still make the same mistake. So Peter says, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answers Peter, will you lay down your life for me? Now you'll notice the inclination I'm putting on the question, but that's, I believe that's how he would have asked it. Look at the question, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. When Jesus says, will you lay down your life for me? One of the things I love about our Lord is he does not take our word for it. Let me explain what I mean. I've said to you so many times in church, words are cheap. Words are easy. And do not be surprised when your Father in heaven holds you accountable to what you have said. Do not be surprised when God tests your words. Don't be surprised because he absolutely does. He tests your words to find out if they're genuine. See, Peter in this moment, I truly believe that he meant what he was saying. He loved Jesus and in that moment he thought when the moment comes I'll happily lay down my life for you. I love you that much Jesus. I walked on water. I've seen you do miracles. I love you that much. But Jesus knew that when the moment came, when the threat was in front of his face, when the thought of losing his life. Remember Peter wasn't just by himself. Peter had a wife. Peter had a household. Peter had in-laws. He had a family. When the threat is there, are you willing to give up everything? Are you willing never to see your wife again, never to see your children again, never to see your family again? When they truly are coming to kill you, will those words stand up? I will give my life for you. The Lord says, will you lay down your life for me? Now, this is an extreme example, but I'd like to remind us as well that Jesus says the same thing to us about lesser examples. Do you give me your life? Will you surrender everything to me? Will you live according to how I've instructed you to? Will you love your brothers and sisters? Jesus tests our words as much as he tests Peter's. And sometimes we can be very bold. I can be very bold. All of us can be very bold to say, I will stand no matter what. Jesus says, okay, we'll see. We will find out. And there it is, a, it is a, a slightly, not frightening, but a, a godly fear should be over us because I do believe there is a day coming when we will find out in Disciples Church who meant it and who didn't. When you look at this country and when you look at where this country is heading and when you look at the different levels of persecution that are happening, teachers losing their job and people being fired for their beliefs, when you look at all the different aspects of this country getting tighter and tighter and tighter upon the truth, a moment is coming when all of those in this church who have said we'll be here till the end, we will find out. Our words will be put to the test. And there may be some missing here who were saying before, I'm not going anywhere. So whereas Peter said, I'll lay down my life for you, what Peter should have said 
is, Lord, if you give me the strength, if you keep me, if you sustain, Lord, I won't do it by myself. I'll run away by myself. But if you sustain me, if you give me the strength, if you help me, then I can give my life for you. Lord, if you empower me, then I can give my life for you. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Jesus prophetically speaks over the life of Peter and prophesies what is about to happen in only about a day's time or a few hours time. And the crow does crow three times and Peter does deny Jesus three times in the events that follow. He even curses in that time, meaning he swears or curses to God, saying that he swears he doesn't know Jesus. And, and the question has to be asked is, why does Jesus do this? Why does he prophesy this over Peter? Why does he predict this? Is it to fill Peter with guilt and condemnation? No. It's to save Peter from Satan. It's to discipline Peter, to love Peter, to save Peter, to convict Peter, to grow him. You might be thinking, how does that grow him? We know that when Peter denied Jesus three times, he looked at Jesus and Jesus looked at him and Peter burst into tears and fled. Do you think he cried for an hour or an evening? Or do you think he was mourning until he saw the Lord again as to the realisation of what he had done? I want to, not a side note really, because what we're seeing here with Peter is exactly this. I just want to highlight something. God's discipline does not feel nice when it's being given. In this country, we are much about feelings, feeling good. God's discipline does not feel nice. It's not meant to. (laughs) And what you're witnessing right now is God's discipline over Peter. When Peter hears that crow the third time and realises he has been placed under God's discipline for the sake of changing Peter, reshaping Peter and correcting Peter. This is what Hebrews says about God's discipline. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. Hebrews is saying when you're being disciplined, it's not enjoyable. It's simply not nice. But later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you are a born-again believer here, you should have been and continue to be trained by God's discipline. I'm a really big nurture over nature guy. What I mean by that is I can't stand the excuse of that's just how they are. My children are like that because that's just their character. No, your children are like that because that's how you train them to be. That's how you raised them to be. That's how you nurtured them to be. That nature thing is just an excuse. Here, the Bible says that Christians are to be trained by God's discipline for righteousness. Peter here is being trained, but it doesn't feel nice at that time. When he sees Jesus, when he starts weeping, that is not, an, that's not a pleasant experience. But do you know what happens afterwards? And this is so glorious. G- Peter goes on to face prison. He goes on to face beatings. He goes on to face lashings. He goes on to face persecution. He goes on to face death. And he never again denied his Lord. God's discipline works. He never again denied Jesus. Do you know one of the differences between saying sorry and repentance? With saying sorry, you can just do the same thing again a thousand times and say sorry again and again and again. But do you know the difference with repentance is the Bible says bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do you know what that means? When you truly repent, there is truly change. You're not repetitively doing the same thing and saying sorry over and over again. When you truly repent, there's truly change in that area. 
And as we can see from what happened to Peter, there is truly change in his character. He never again denies Jesus. Hebrews 12, 6, 11 is lovely. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. I have some good and bad news for you. The bad news is this. If you are a child of God, you can absolutely guarantee you are going to be disciplined at some point. The good news is, if you're being disciplined, it is only evidence that you are indeed a child of God. Because he only disciplines those he loves and chastises his children. He does not discipline unbelievers. He does not discipline unbelievers. There is punishment there. But for the believer, discipline. And there are, in my experience, and there probably are more in my experience, the Father uses two methods of discipline. One can be a very short, sharp, with the rod. He can use brothers or sisters to do it. It can come by the Holy Spirit, but it's short, short and sharp, and it hurts. Ah, I really shouldn't have done that. And, it's, and it doesn't last very long, and the Father carries on with you. Usually when you're a bit of a younger Christian, it's that short, sharp, and then you carry on. But as you grow in your faith and as the excuses dwindle and you, you really don't have any excuse for the mistakes you make anymore, there is another type of discipline God uses that in my experience is actually the worst of the two. Distance. Distance. He never goes anywhere. He's still in the same house with you. But he says, go to your room. And you feel distant. You feel like he's not within grasp anymore. When the Bible says, do not be harsh to your wife or your prayers will be hindered. When you're harsh with your wife, God is distant. Your prayers are not reaching him. He says, no, make things right with your wife. Then come back to me. Distance is one of the, one of the strongest types of discipline I've seen God use of placing someone to the side and saying, you've got to think about this for a little while. And it's not condemnation. But for those of us who understand what I'm saying, there is a deep mourning within a believer's heart when we have sinned against our Father. Even after we've been washed clean, even after we've been forgiven, even after we know that we're okay with God, there's still a deep mourning that can last hours or maybe even days knowing that I, I just shouldn't have done that. Because we have to remember the verse that says, that God allows no temptation to come to us without having given us a way out of it. And so when you become God's children, not only do you become loved and disciplined and protected, but excuses tend to also go out of the window. No temptation has come, ac come across us that God hasn't given us a way out of. So God's discipline is good, but please understand that it is also at the time painful but later it yields the fruitful, peaceful righteousness from those who are trained by it. Please do not think that you should leave sermons every single Sunday feeling good. You should not leave sermons every single Sunday feeling good. There may be some Sundays you don't leave feeling so good because God's talking to you about an area of your life that he's not pleased with and wants to change. And that can be painful, but it's a beautiful thing when it's finished. It's a beautiful thing when God trains it out of you and breaks it and is away with and done. And that's exactly what happened for Peter. Peter's words got him into trouble, but Jesus loved Peter. It's also a great sign of Jesus's grace for Peter as well. Jesus said, if you deny me in front of men, I will deny you in front of my father. Peter denied Jesus three times. For the more legalistic of those among us, that means Peter's done. He's finished. You deny me in front of men, I deny you in front of the Father. Well, you denied me three times, Peter, you're out of here. But it's a beautiful sign of Jesus' commitment and grace towards us. That instead of just discarding Peter, he disciplines Peter, reshapes Peter, changes Peter. And makes him into an apostle who, in my opinion, died an awful death. But did so in glory and honour towards Jesus, never denying his Lord again. So we're going to go into John 14. This is Jesus now talking to the disciples. He says, Let not your hearts be troubled. 
Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus is here telling his, 12, telling his 11, sorry, 11 disciples at this point, Judas is gone, telling the 11 disciples that I'm leaving, you cannot come with me. Peter says, where are you going? And then here what we see, look what we see next. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I think it's pretty safe to say that if Jesus is saying this, there was a few troubled hearts in the room. Let not your hearts be troubled. And I love what Jesus says here. What is the um, remedy for a troubled heart? Jesus gives us here the remedy for a troubled heart. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Here's the remedy. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Some have tried to say that when Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me, it's a, it's a, that's a sign that Jesus isn't God. To see, he's saying, believe in God and then believe in him separately. If anything, just to completely counter that, it's the absolute opposite. If Jesus wasn't God, how could he say, believe in me? If he was a man, it would mean nothing. If he was an angel, it would mean nothing. It doesn't mean anything to believe in an angel or to believe in a man. But the fact that Jesus does say, believe in God, believe in me in the same sentence only clarifies that he has equality with God, only clarifies that he is indeed God the Son. There's a Psalm 40, there's a Psalm called Psalm 46 that I would advise um, you go and read in your own time, but I want to read just one line from it, a line that has spoken a great deal to me over the last two, three weeks, especially as pressure began amounting and we were getting a lot of pressure from different people and hospitals about doing this and doing that. And there was a line sent to me from a brother two weeks ago. He randomly sent it to me by text. And then another brother, the day my wife was giving birth, sent it to me as well. And the line is this. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I don't care what's going on around you. I don't care what tornado you're stuck in the middle of with all the different things flying around your head. Be still. Don't move. Be still and know that God is on the throne, that God is real, that it's all in God's hands. What is the remedy for a troubled heart? Believe in God. Believe in God. And they're, they're opposites, by the way. Some people say, no, Aaron, well, I'm fearful, but I'm not doubting. I'm terribly, terribly anxious and I'm terribly fearful and I'm all over the place, but I still believe in God and I'm not doubting. Well, that's a contradiction. They're opposites. If you're troubled, the opposite, believe in God and let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding take away that trouble and replace it. God does not call you to be troubled and believe in him at the same time. He calls you, if you are troubled, to believe in him and have peace. Have peace. In the same way, Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What is the remedy for anxiety? Go to God. Believe in God. Be still and know that I am God. So Jesus says this to the disciples who are finding out that their rabbi, the man they've followed for the last three years, is about to leave and they can't go with him. And so Jesus says, don't worry, don't be anxious, don't be troubled, believe in God, believe also in me. And this is where we get to what I think is just some of the most exciting verses in the New Testament. Jesus says, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be 
also. In my Father's house are many rooms. In your translation, it may say many mansions, but in the original Greek in which it was written, it means there are many dwelling places. That's the word, many dwelling places. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And Jesus says something quite remarkable here. I go to prepare a dwelling place for you. I'm going to the Father to get the house ready for when you arrive. (laughs) If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? If you're excited about being in heaven with Jesus, you are nowhere near as excited as Jesus is at the thought of you being in heaven with him. You are not as excited as Jesus is to have you with him. How do I know this? John chapter 17, he prays a high priestly prayer and says, Father, I desire so much that they would be with me with you. However, while they're here, keep them, Lord. Isn't it a beautiful picture of Jesus' heart? that he looks beyond the cross, looks beyond the suffering, looks beyond the resurrection, and he can't wait to see you with him in heaven. He goes to prepare a place specifically for you and I. And in my Father's house are many dwelling places. Jesus is not idle right now. The Bible tells us that he is an interceder, He intercedes between us and the Father in heaven. It's no longer the priest or the pastor. It's Jesus in heaven interceding for us. When you pray, all of your prayers go through Jesus to the Father. That's why we pray in the Lord's name. We cannot come to the Father unless it's through Jesus. He is now our high priest, the man we come to, the God we come to, to speak to the Father. But he's not only interceding, he's also preparing the home, preparing the place for his bride. I've used the analogy, and it's not an analogy I made up, it's an analogy that the Bible talks about, about the bride, the Jewish bride who would be placed to the side for a certain amount of time. She would be prepared and built up and made ready for marriage. The husband would go to the house, prepare the house after a certain amount of time, come back, get the bride, marry the bride, live together forever and ever and ever. That's the same thing that's happening right now. The church is the betrothed bride of Christ. We are in a place right now of sanctification, of getting ready, getting prepared for the wedding. And when our husband-to-be is ready, he will come and collect us, take us to the ceremony and take us to the wedding feast and then to our eternal dwelling place, which is why it's called dwelling places. But he also says something else that's really going to be the last focus and the main focus of the rest of this sermon. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. Now this is where we enter in, we cross that line which I like to call the debate line. Christians love the debate line. Any excuse to debate is is a Christian's best dream come true. So we're going to cross that line and some of you may not agree with me. That's okay. Come and debate me afterwards. (laughs) But when Jesus says, I will come again and will take you to myself, I truly am convinced that he is referring to the rapture. I truly... Oh, that was a lot of... mm, So I'm assuming... (laughs) I'm assuming you won't be debating me too much, but I'm truly convinced that he is talking and referring to the rapture of his saints. And this is why. The first reason, the first clue I have to saying this is Jesus says something very specific. He says, I will come again and take you to myself. Okay, he says, I will take you to where I am. Now, I, have to be, I want to be careful here so we don't confuse this. Many people confuse the second coming of Christ and the rapture as the same thing. Or they get confused as to how it works. I want to explain it in layman's terms as simply as I can. 
The first time Christ came, he came to earth. His feet touched the ground. That was the first coming of Christ. The second coming of Christ, he comes back to earth. His feet touch the ground. First coming, second coming. But the rapture is a different thing altogether. In 1 Philippians chapter 4, it says we meet him in the clouds or heavens, whichever translation you have. His feet don't touch the ground. He takes us to where he is. That's a very big difference. So I'm going to read to you first, oh sorry, sorry, first Thessalonians, not Philippians. First Philippians chapter 4. This is what it says. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, dead, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. Stop there. He's saying we declare this to you by a word from the Lord. This has come directly from Jesus himself. That we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The dead will go first. When the rapture happens, the dead will go first to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. And then those who are left, the living, will be taken as well with them to meet the Lord in the clouds, in the air. He has not yet touched down on earth. We are meeting him in the heavens. He comes down halfway, he brings us up halfway, and we are with him forevermore. Now the word rapture is not found anywhere in the Bible, a bit like the word trinity is not found anywhere in the Bible. We get the word rapture from the word hapazo in the Greek. The word hapazo is the words here used caught up. In 1 Thessalonians when it says we're caught up to him, it's the word hapazo. And what it means is snatched out, snatch away, carry off by force, claim one for yourself eagerly. The idea is we're snatched very, very quickly. In Acts chapter 8, when Philip baptizes the eunuch and he comes up and he disappears and goes from there to miles away to another city, it's the same word used, hapazo. He was snatched away by the Lord's Spirit. In the book of Genesis, seventh born from Adam, the, the, the man called Enoch, it says he doesn't die, but he was caught up to the Lord. The same word, hapazo, snatched away. Elijah, when he goes up in the chariot, hapazo, snatched away. It's the same word used. So the idea is the Lord is taking someone quickly up to him or with Philip horizontally. Horizontally? Yeah, horizontally across the earth. Hapazo, snatched away. And what does Jesus say? I'm going to come back and take you that where I am, you may be also. Jesus is going to bring us to himself. Now, one of the reasons I don't believe that Jesus is talking about the second coming is if he was saying to them, I'm going to come back on the second coming and get you, what he would have to say is I'm going to come back. I'm going to defeat Israel's enemies. I'm going to reign for a thousand years. I'm then going to have the battle of Armageddon. We're then going to have the great white throne and then I'm going to bring you to myself. But he doesn't say that, does he? I'm coming back to Hapazo. I'm coming back to snatch you. I'm coming back to bring you to where I am. And we meet him in the air in the heavens. Jesus says, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? So Jesus confuses the disciples even more with this, for them at the time, very cryptic kind of sentences he's saying to them. They won't understand a lot of what he's saying. 
And he says, but it's a good thing, guys. You know the way. You know how to get there. And Thomas turns around and says, Lord, I don't even know where the destination is. How on earth can I know how to get there? I don't have any directions. I don't know the way. And then you would have heard me quote it so many times. My favorite, favorite, favorite verse. I always say my favorite verse. I think I probably say that every verse. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas says, Lord, how do we get there? What are the directions? What's the way? What's the path? Jesus says, you've been following him for three years. I'm right here. I am the directions. I am the way. I am the path. I am the door. In early Christianity, it wasn't called Christianity early on. It was actually called the way. They used to call each other the way. And for the Romans and for the Jewish people at this time, it was seen as a very cultish uh, title for the believers to use. But it wasn't. When they said, we belong to the way, all they were saying was, we belong to Jesus Christ. They could have said the truth or the life. And it all would have meant the same thing. We follow, we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way. I am the only way. Notice he does not say, I am one of the ways. I am the only way. There is only one way in this world to get to heaven, and not even to get to heaven. I've, I've come to realize this recently. It's not about heaven. It's about being where Jesus is. If Jesus moved out of heaven, I'd want to move with him. It's not about heaven, it's about Jesus. It's about knowing the person we were created to have a relationship with. That's the point. Christianity is not a get out of jail free card, how can I get to heaven? Christianity is about having a relationship with the creator who created us for a relationship with him. If you don't know Jesus, you are indeed lost. If you don't know Jesus, you do not have truth. If you don't know Jesus, you only know death. It doesn't matter what external things you have around you that tell you the opposite. Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Without him, we have none of those three things. No matter what our external materialistic life may lie to us about, it doesn't matter. You take all of that away, and there's a big difference between an unbeliever and a believer. You take everything away from an unbeliever, they're left with nothing. You take everything away from a believer, they're left with everything, because they've still got Jesus. They've still got Jesus. He is all we need. I've often said that this, we, we would actually do better in our faith if we were stripped away from a lot of what we have in this life in the Western world. How much more devoted, zealous, passionate, diligent, loving would we be if we weren't so distracted from all that Satan distracts us with in the Western world. And I say that as one who would feel just as uncomfortable as you having my sofas taken or my bed taken or my TV I like watching movies on taken. I would be just as uncomfortable. But I bet you anything, I give it enough time, I'd be far more diligent, far more dedicated, far more zealous as well. He is all we need. He's the only way, the truth and the life. And he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. No other religion, no other belief, no self-help, no nothing. No one comes to God except through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Saviour, through the Son of God, through God the Son. From now on, this is what Jesus says at the end, from now on you do know him and have seen him, referring to the Father. He says to the disciples, now you do know the Father and you have seen the Father. Now, the second bit, having seen the Father, I'm going to leave until next week. And we're going to cover that next week because that's a good fun study in itself, especially from what Philip's about to say back to him. But what I do just want to quickly finish before we go to the next part is from now on you do know him. Jesus says to the disciples, from this point on, now you know the Father. Now you know him. I want to read to you, in my opinion, one of the most miraculous statements Jesus makes in the entire of the entirety of the Bible it's found in John 20 17 
And I, I can't emphasize this enough, that in these few verses is the entirety of the gospel, the entirety of why Jesus came, the entirety of the whole entire point of our creation, from Genesis to Revelation, in these few verses is all of it encompassed. A hundred sermons lay in these few verses. Don't worry, you're only getting one today. No one run, but a hundred sermons in these couple of verses. John 20, 17, he has resurrected. Mary Magdalene is clinging to him. And Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now listen to this, listen. But go to my brothers. Stop there. First time ever that Jesus has referred to the disciples as brothers. Before they were friends and students, Jesus says, go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. First time ever Jesus has said that you are my brothers and my father is now your father. My God is now your God. Now you may think I've just made a big meal out of those few verses, but I can't stress to you enough the implication of those few verses. What you're reading is why, were we, why we were created in Genesis. That's what you're reading. What you're reading in those few verses is the entire point of all of this. What you're reading in those few verses is the entire point of the cross of Christ. The entire gospel was for that mission, for that end, for that accomplishment. What you're reading is the entire of Revelation summed up, an eternity in an eternal relationship between father and children made possible by our brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. May I just say big, 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 big brother, by the way, massive brother, biggest brother, not small brother or equal brother, big, 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 big bro, big bro, much bigger than us. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make to you is this, something remarkable is happening here. Why did Jesus endure what he endured? Why was he tortured? Why would he be so willing to carry the cross to his death? Because this is what he foresaw. This is what he knew would be accomplished. He would be the firstborn among many siblings. He would make us children of God and we would be able to cry out, Abba, Father. Never in history has this happened apart from this moment right here. Now he is your father. Now I am your brother. Now he is your God. It's quite incredible when we realise what Jesus is saying. Now, we're going to finish with John there. I've got about 15 minutes left, and I want to divert to something that it's going to be uh, strange for me to do. I'm going to divert to a testimony. And it, the reason it's strange is because I, I'd like to think that when it comes to this pulpit, I'm quite passionate about keeping it safe from anything that could potentially be unbiblical. And I'm not saying what I'm about to say is unbiblical. On the contrary, it's very scriptural. But it's very unusual for me to actually bring something in and base an entire sermon on it. But that's what I'm about to do. So weigh and test what I'm about to say. I've shared it with a brother already and we were both equally as excited as to what the Lord was communicating to us. And I'm hoping it's going to excite you too. This is where I start talking about my baby being born, so apologies for that. I've got pictures and everything. No, I'm joking. I'm like, I'm like, Look! <laughs> I'm joking. My wife, apart from being an extraordinary woman, has been gifted with very particular gifts in the spirit. And the gifts that she's been gifted with in the past have come across as dreams, prophetic visions, and, and words of the Lord, mainly future tense. And many of what my wife has been gifted with have come to pass time and time and time again. Now, for all of you who know Haley, you won't know that because the Lord gifts the humble. 
And she wouldn't want any of you to know this, and she didn't really even want me to say this. It took some convincing. But the reason I'm saying this is because something quite remarkable happened two weeks ago to my wife. We were waiting for my child to be born. She was overdue, as you know, by quite a lot, 12 days in the end, but it was getting close to that time, a lot of pressure from a lot of different people about what we should do and how we should do it. And that's when the Lord said to me, be still and know that I'm God, I've got this. She'll come when I want her to come, and it happened, and praise the Lord. My, my daughter was born on the 19th of February, but on the 14th, 15th, and 16th, something very strange happened to my wife, and I'm going to share it with you now because it correlates with this sermon. On the 14th of February, my wife was woken up at about 2 a.m. in the morning, and she, she, her description is, and she asked me to be very careful not to over-exaggerate, so when she watches this, I'm going to be very careful to tell it exactly how she told it. She woke up, and the second she woke up, all she had in her head was a verse. She was woken up by a, a, by a Bible verse. Literally, eyes open, Bible verse in her mind. What is that all about? And it was like it was seared in her mind. She literally just had it right there. And the Bible verse was John 16, 21. Here's what it says. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for a joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, when, she, when I'd woken up hours and hours later, she shared what had been given to her in the night. And I said, what a beautiful thing. The Lord is encouraging you about childbirth. That's all it is. He's just encouraging you about a child being born. You're going to have to go through a tough time, but it's going to be joyful after. Praise the Lord. Let's pray and let's just praise him for having encouraged you with that verse. And that's how we took it. For the rest of the day, we just said that's all it was. Well, the night after, on the 15th, she was awoken around about the same time with another verse. And the verse now was Matthew 24, 7. And this slightly contradicted my interpretation of why she was given the verse. Here's what Matthew 24, 7 says. Nation will rise against nation. Oh, there goes my interpretation straight out the window. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning, but the birth pains. So she woke up and she said, when I woke up hours and hours and hours later, she, she woke up and said to me, Aaron, I just received this verse last night. And I started thinking, that's, that's strange. Okay, it has birth pains in it, but nation, war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. What, Lord, what are you trying to say? So we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. And then in the evening, I prayed again, Lord, if you really are speaking to my wife, give her something else. Help us to understand what it is you're trying to say to her. And the night after, 16th, I want to make it clear, by the way, my wife knows her Bible, but she does not know it well enough to know these verses off the top of her head. She knows her Bible very well, but she wouldn't be able to just say, oh, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. But the verses were there as if she'd memorized them. Now, the next night, the last night that it happened, we prayed it didn't happen the, the, the night after this. The last night, three nights, 16th of February, the verse that came to us, Matthew 24, 37. 38. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the son of man. Now, when she told me on the third night, that's the verse she'd received. I started to get very excited and I started to truly go back and start to be like a bit like a Berean and say, Lord, what are you trying to say? So this made me go back to the first night, which when she received the passage from John. And I found something very remarkable. Every single passage had one thing in common, the rapture. Every single passage had one thing in common, the end, Jesus coming back. Now, before I go any farther, I wanna make something very clear. I am not about to give you a date, a time, an estimation. <laughs> And let me also make something clear. If you listen to any preacher, they may be good men, but they are acting foolishly if they tell you what year, what day, what time. They are foolish in doing so. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. You're not meant to. You don't know that. I don't know that. No one knows that. God's not going to tell anyone that because it contradicts his word. However, in John 16, 21, if you go to it and have a read, you'll find that what it's referring to is the end. It's referring to not being troubled. It's referring to the rapture. So if you have a Bible with you, turn to it with me. 
and we'll have a read of it. And then we're going to read the other ones as well. John 16, 21. And here's what it says. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he was talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while and you will see me. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human, be human, a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take that joy from you. In Matthew 24, if you want to turn to Matthew 24, which was the, the second day. In Matthew 24, 7, it, or number 3, sorry, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. Then nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are but the beginning of the birth pains. And then to sum it all up, the last one was Matthew 24, 36. And this is the last one that my wife received at 2 a.m. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. What's that referring to? The rapture. How can it be referring to anything else? God has given us a timeline for everything else. The Son knows everything else. There's only one thing in the Bible that it says the Son does not know, but only the Father. And that's the moment he comes back and takes us. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Listen to what it says next. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day our Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in the part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we prayed and considered, and it seemed to us that the Lord was talking to us about the rapture, about the end times, about when we will be taken to him. And then something beautiful happened on the fourth day. We began to realise something. We are sitting here at this point waiting for a baby that's well overdue. It seems to be late. It seems to be late until a sister said to me, it's not late, it's perfectly on time, just not your time. The rapture right now seems to be late. <laughs> Lord, I'm looking out. I'm seeing what's going on, clock's ticking, I'm ready to go. It seems to be late. And it, it dawned on us that we're waiting for a baby that has not turned up. We're waiting for a baby that's overdue. But then something else dawned on us. Our house is fully prepared. For nine months, we have prepared every single room in our house. We've painted, we've got ready, we've got rid of things and got things in. Our house is ready to go. Our minds are fortified. Our hearts are willing. Every night we went to bed expecting a baby. Every morning we, went, we woke up expecting this to be the day. Every hour of those days was in full expectation that at any moment our baby is going to arrive and our house is in order for when it does. Does. And here is God communicating to us, this is exactly how you should be 
towards the rapture. This is exactly how you should be towards me returning and collecting you. Your house should be ready. You should go to bed expectant. You should wake up expectant. You should think it's going to be today. And if it's not today, it's going to be tomorrow. Every second should be in expectation of the Lord returning. If it is not, you are in great danger of being the unwise servant who simply thought there's a long time before my Lord returns. I'll do what I want. Or the unwise virgin who thought the night is going on too long. I don't need all this oil. I believe the message for today, along with John 13, 14, is we need to be ready and expectant for the Lord to return at any moment. From this sermon, you need to go away and reevaluate your priorities. You need to reevaluate what you're putting your time into. You need to reevaluate what your home looks like what your order looks like. You need to reevaluate how you're living your life. You need to reevaluate your sanctification. You need to reevaluate how you're following the Lord, what your devotion looks like, what your dedication looks like. And you might say to me, well, Aaron, I'm a Christian. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to heaven anyway. You can say that if you want, but I know for sure that when I stand in front of the kings of kings, I want to stand in front of him as one who was ready, not as one who was caught doing something I shouldn't have been doing because I was lazy. Let me ask you a question. How can you catch a thief when you don't know when they're coming? There's only one answer. You have to be ready all the time. If I told you I was going to come and take something out of your house in the next month, but I didn't give you a day or an hour, for the next month, I guarantee you'd guard your house a heck of a lot more diligently than you do right now. You'd be waiting. You'd be ready all the time. This shook me and Haley up. It shook us up. Because from that point on, I started looking at life like right now, all of you go. Right now, he takes us now. And I'm now no longer surprised if right now, he actually did just take us now. But there's two important questions to this. One, if he took us now, would you be ready? Two, would you be left behind? If Jesus took this church right now, which he very well could, would you be left sitting in these seats? And who else would be left sitting around you? Scary thing to say, right? But if I don't say it, who will? Jesus is coming back soon. He is coming to collect his bride. And we will go in a twinkling of an eye. One man will be working and one man will be taken. One man will be sleeping and a woman will be left. It, we will be taken like that. Gone. And we are called to be ready day and night for Jesus coming back now. How do you want him to find you when he returns? In what state do you want him to find his bride when he returns? I'm not going to get into you about pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. But one of the only things that leans towards a pre-trib understanding is the rapture is the only event in the Bible that has no indicators to it. Understand this, the rapture is the only event in the Bible that has no indicators. There is nothing that warns you it's going to happen. It just happens at an hour you do not expect it. So, praise God, our baby came on the 19th. She arrived exactly on time when God had allotted for her to arrive. We were not surprised because I went to bed and woke up every day thinking this was the day. And although it's been tough, we were ready. The house was ready. The order was in place. We had what we needed. Now we have to do this spiritually. Now we have to get ready for the Lord to come and take us at any moment, at any time. So I pray today that not only will you be filled with a sense of excitement, because the title of this sermon is Jesus is coming back soon. And that's not unbiblical to say, Jesus himself said it. 
I'm coming back soon. However, the application of this sermon is, are you ready and waiting? Will he find you with your bags packed, ready to go? Not that you get to take your bags with you, but will he find you with your bags packed, ready to go, day and night? You wake up in the morning, this might be it. You go to bed at night, this might be it. Or will he find you like the lazy servant who thought, I've got loads of time. He's not going to come for another thousand years, hundred years. This has to happen first. This has to happen first. We've got loads and loads of time. Don't worry about it. And then the king is there and you realise, maybe I should have listened to that sermon. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, the term that your servants used to use in the early church was Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We see it in Revelation, Lord, in the last book, the last page even. Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus, come. Lord, help us to cut off any strings attached to this world. Lord, help us not to have any idols in our hearts and in our minds. Help us, Lord, to be wanderers on this earth, to be sojourners. Help us not to have any alliance to this world, to this life. But help us, Lord, please, to be in full expectation, morning and evening, that at any moment you could come back and take us. Help us to be the wise virgin and the wise servant who was expectant of their master at any hour. Help us to not be arrogant in our thinking. Help us to not be prideful thinking we have more time than we do. Lord, we pray Maranatha. We pray, come Lord Jesus, come today. And Lord, if not today, we pray it tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, the day after. And we continue to pray until the day you take us home or to the day we fall asleep. But Lord, we pray Maranatha, just like the early disciples prayed as well. Lord, please build in us ready hearts, let not any of my brothers and sisters be caught off guard. Let me not be caught off guard. Let us not be surprised. Let us be ready day and night. And Father, I want to pray for anyone who has not yet followed the way, anyone who does not yet know the way, you, Lord. I want to pray for anyone, Lord, if the rapture happened right now, they wouldn't be going. I want to pray for them, Lord. I just pray, Heavenly Father, they would, that you would open their hearts and minds to the truth. I pray they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, confess him as their Lord. I pray they would give their lives to you, Lord Jesus. I pray they would be saved, washed clean by the cross, by the blood spilt on the cross, saved through the resurrection, being born again, Lord. We just pray, Heavenly Father, for all those souls watching online or here in this room who have yet to know you, we just pray, Lord, for their salvation. And we thank you, Father, for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for the hope we have. May these words meditate on my brothers' and sisters' hearts. May they go out and not return to you until they have done the work they set out to do. And Lord, please, I pray most of all, let us take this seriously. We have been left with no excuse. If you return and we are surprised, we have been left with no excuse. Help us, Lord, please, to take our sanctification seriously. In Jesus' name, amen.